Thank you for coming today and sharing in this conversation. I want to talk to you about startup ecosystems. That's a familiar idea. Everyone knows the model Silicon Valley created way back in the 1950s and 60s. And everybody knows that regions all over the world have been trying to replicate the Valley's success in doing that. Maybe you've been involved in those efforts yourself. Here in the Metro New York City area, I've dedicated much of my career to this. But something important is changing now. Startup ecosystems are rapidly moving to the cloud. I want to talk to you about what that might mean for you, for your colleagues, and partners, and for the future. Exactly what do I mean when I say that startup ecosystems are moving to the cloud? Well, when an ecosystem moves to the cloud, its community and the resources are no longer locally sourced or even regionally sourced, but they are globally sourced. But one thing doesn't change. What makes for a robust cloud-based startup ecosystem is similar to what made Silicon Valley so strong. You still need a high density of entrepreneurs, investors, and mentors. You still need strong institutions of higher education that are deeply embedded with entrepreneurs. Places that develop exciting new ideas, like the next Google, and nurture dynamic young innovators. As with geographical ecosystems, you need frequent activities and strong networks intentionally designed to help people and institutions cross-pollinate. And finally, you need a generous culture of giving back and helping others, particularly from the successful entrepreneurs who have already exited. If I'm right and entrepreneurial ecosystems are moving to the cloud, this has specific implications for each of their participants. That's what I want to look at. What this shift means for entrepreneurs, for investors, for academic institutions, for government, nonprofits, and for corporations. So if you're an entrepreneur, succeeding in a cloud-based entrepreneurial ecosystem means deepening your own focus on digital soft skills. For example, building and collaborating in virtual teams. Each of these digital soft skills requires its own discipline and is evolving its own best practices. And you need to be intentional about mastering them. So if you're pitching and presenting to remote audiences, are you thinking about ways your pitches could be more dynamic or shorter? When you're doing less in-person networking, your digital networking becomes even more important than it's ever been. How do you choose the virtual events, conferences, and webinars you'll participate in? How do you set goals for your participation and assess whether you've met them? And of course, when you do get that in-person opportunity, how are you making the most of it? I have two specific recommendations. First, work on becoming a better storyteller. And second, make sure everything you do is aimed at building trust with your investors, your talent, your collaborators, and your customers. Lately, we've all seen that trust is in short supply, and we've seen what happens when it isn't there, and it isn't pretty. Therefore, everything you do on social media must enhance your digital brand as a smart and generous leader who has integrity and empathy. One last point for entrepreneurs. In a cloud-based global ecosystem, you can find talent anywhere, and you could also be talent anywhere. Once COVID is in the past, more entrepreneurs will likely be digital nomads living in one place for weeks or months and then moving on. And while they might be tracking industry trends and staying in touch with their network online, what startup community will they actually belong to? Of course, it won't just be digital nomads. We can also expect to see a larger number of older founders become the majority of founders going forward. They will tend to be more settled down and statistics show their probability of success is higher than other groups. And they seem to be spreading out as well, as do their employees. And a lot of people who have a choice are relocating into smaller cities and towns. That obviously affects where you find talent, but it also affects how you define and organize work. Some things are clear. Geography doesn't restrict who you hire nearly as much as it did before. Conversely though, it's more important to pick people who've shown they can thrive in virtual environments. You need greater clarity upfront as to your job descriptions and how you define remote work. Onboarding gets even more important because you can't do as much culture building in person. 
Clear expectations and accountability are more important than ever. All this means the hard work of being a leader gets harder. It gets tougher to work around a manager's failings. And you need to work even harder at picking and developing great leaders. So what if you're an investor? Above all, playing in the global cloud-based ecosystem means you're competing with more funding sources, especially domestically, but also globally. As we all know, there is plenty of capital out there looking for returns right now. And in order for you to get into the best deals early and to get the best terms, you'll have to work harder to build your own brand. It's more important than ever that you know your own differentiation and competitive advantage, and that it makes sense to the entrepreneurs who you want to work with. To keep your own hub as robust as possible, you'll have to make the most of whatever geographical advantages you still have. That means stepping up to identify, fund, and sustain entrepreneurs who move into your own area, something that rich entrepreneurs more than VCs have typically done in the past. In addition, smaller VCs and investors will likely need to move into deals earlier than they have in the past. Five months into the pandemic, an investor survey revealed that 86% of them had already closed a deal 100% virtually. And as things accelerate, the era of investors living close to their portfolio companies is coming to an end. Zoom has unlocked more capital than at any time in our history, and therefore, even post-pandemic, you'll need to evaluate new opportunities and teams faster and more efficiently. Because when travel isn't essential, a lot more opportunities and competition will come your way. You don't have to be geographically close to the deal anymore, but you do have to be the smartest, most valuable money in your sector. What if you're an academic institution? Then you know, probably better than anyone else, how much the pandemic and the cloud have turned the world upside down. Maybe you had to go digital and remote almost overnight. You might have found yourself facing all kinds of questions about the value of what you do and about what really differentiates you when everyone suddenly looks like Zoom University. Well, more than ever, you need a robust entrepreneurial program to attract students, faculty, and the community and to build the robust connections and networks you need to sustain yourselves. Many institutions are already thinking about how they need to raise their profiles, and not just locally, but globally. Focusing on entrepreneurship is a powerful way to do that, while also potentially creating new funding streams through partnerships, tech transfer spinouts, and licensing opportunities. Institutions also need to encourage and nurture student entrepreneurship by intentionally linking it with their broader digital ecosystems. That's good for the students, and over the long term, it's indispensable for the institution itself. Universities need to build far-reaching networks of successful alumni who know where they came from, know who nurtured them, and will pay it forward by helping their ecosystem succeed. Mentoring, guest lecturing, and investing in student ventures will be even more important. This can also help colleges and universities create sustainable revenue streams they desperately need. But I want to stress that it's about much more than that. It's about the mission. If you're concerned about inequality, diversity, and inclusion, you want to be opening pathways for new kinds of entrepreneurs, whether they're members of previously underserved communities or immigrants. This is a problem that desperately needs solving, and schools can play unique roles in solving it. Tomorrow's entrepreneurship programs are likely to take many different forms, not just degree programs. So institutions will be standing up more e-labs, sandboxes, boot camps and accelerators, and they will be mixing on-campus and online components in new and novel ways. I'm very excited about the opportunities to develop even more creative collaborations with industry. One last thing I frequently share with the college presidents that I advise. Whether your students are enrolled in an entrepreneurship program or not, they're going to need entrepreneurial skills and mindsets in order to thrive. And that includes the digital soft skills I've already talked about. Because who are you teaching that won't need to make a strong pitch online someday? Or work well in virtual teams? Or have dozens of different jobs, including freelance gigs and side hustles, right? And this kind of knowledge applies to your faculty and staff too. Because your institution is going to have to be a whole lot more agile and collaborative to survive and thrive going forward. So what if you are in government? trying to help the people you represent or serve. Nothing I've said changes the need to focus on controlling costs and tax rates. But being competitive isn't just about tax rates. 
If it were, Denmark wouldn't be one of the most entrepreneur-friendly nations on the planet. Wherever you can, you also need to look for other ways to give entrepreneurs the flexibility to start, grow, and exit their companies, and then do it all over again, and give back to their communities. Speaking of which, how is your user experience? What's it like for entrepreneurs and other citizens to operate and navigate your red tape? Is it easy for them to take advantage of the resources you offer? Entrepreneurs are operating in an on-demand world. That's what customers expect. It's what citizens expect too. More broadly, when people can work anywhere, they'll work where they want to be. So you need to focus on quality of life. That means schools, culture, diversity, and inclusion, transportation, safety, and amenities. And just a thought, if you are in the habit of giving financial incentives to companies that relocate, maybe you should think about providing incentives for individual professionals who do too. Some cities are already experimenting with this, and so it might be worth piloting your own program one day. Successful entrepreneurial ecosystems include nonprofit support organizations whose whole job is to promote their success. I've personally spent many years working in this space and understand just how impactful they are to all entrepreneurs at whatever stage they are in. But as ecosystems go virtual, they risk feeling vaguer and more amorphous. So organizations that prioritize the deliberate construction of an active community become more important than ever. So do organizations that promote one-on-one -on -one mentorship, link entrepreneurs to trusted advisors, and help emerging entrepreneurs access funding and talent. Just like other organizations, nonprofits in the entrepreneurial space will have to evolve. They may run smaller, more frequent events, and they need to begin experimenting with new forms of hybrid events with digital and in-person components. Finally, established corporations have always been crucial to regional, geographically based ecosystems, whether it was HP and Apple in California or Bell Labs in New Jersey. They will still be important, but they will also need to be more nimble and they will need to resist the temptation to cut back on innovation funding in a time of unprecedented disruption. Many of the most prominent corporates will face the challenge of balancing local investment with seeking out opportunities in new innovation hubs as they emerge. Both offer value, but as workforces disperse, the sense that a company is a stakeholder in its locality or region may further deteriorate. Of course, this is an existential problem for the localities themselves. But companies will also have to be intentional about maintaining strong relationships with existing ecosystems that offer value in socially positive and productive ways, even as they seek out virtual opportunities that could be anywhere. As I hope you can see, just because an entrepreneurial ecosystem exists in the cloud and just because you can plug into it from anywhere, the need for a deep, robust, rich community doesn't go away. After the pandemic, if anything, it becomes more important than ever. You can gain enormous value from a cloud-based ecosystem because it helps you access innovation from all over the planet, but you'll only get what you put into it. That means positioning yourself to maximize these new opportunities. And that also means contributing to make those new ecosystems as robust as the best ones you've experienced before. They won't emerge by themselves. They need intentional effort. And the intentional efforts we make now will pay off handsomely in the future. <laughs>